Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Stage A. And very happy to introduce uh, Sophie Lovejoy, who's going to tell us uh, everything you ever wanted to know about how to dispose of, of a body. So, thank you, Sophie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this celebration of the... Oh, wrong script. Hang on. So, hello. I'd love to say that I'm delighted to see so many people in the audience for this talk, but actually, am I the only one that finds it terrifying that this many people want to know how to dispose of a body? All of the methods that I'm going to talk about today are either legal or in the process of being approved. I was very tempted to pretend that this was a practical session and with the help of my teenage son to do so. So a few days ago, he's, he's just there, a few days ago I actually found myself googling body bags that would fit my son <laughs> and decided that was wrong on so many levels we weren't going to take that approach. Um, just in case there's anybody squeamish in the audience or there's children, I'm not going to be showing graphic pictures. I'm not going to be talking about anything too revolting. I am going to be talking about burying, burning, dissolving, and freezing bodies. One thing that I've chosen not to talk about today is something called plastination, which was a process developed by um, Gunther von Hagens in the 70s. And his Body Worlds exhibition is based on that. The reason I'm not going to do it today is it's absolutely horrible and I'm not showing pictures of that. So if you're interested in plastination as a process, go and have a look. Just before we start, I really want to share that this talk almost didn't happen. A week ago, I nearly pulled out because my eldest is poorly. So after three, could you all really loudly read what's on this slide? One, two, three. Hello, yes. Thank you. I know that she's watching it on the live stream. Right, so a brief, brief bit of background then. I had a humanist baby naming ceremony for Tess in 2001, and as a result, I got trained by Margaret Nelson of Suffolk Humanists to join the ceremonies team. In 2004, I conducted my first funeral and I've conducted a couple of hundred since then. I don't do it full-time, I do it part-time with some other jobs. It's an amazingly rewarding job to have, and it's the easiest bit of lecturing you will ever do, because not only is everybody in the audience grateful, nobody ever asks you questions at the end. So this session's gonna be a whistle-stop tour of body donation, burials, cremations, what to do with ashes, and some more recent developments. It's definitely not going to be comprehensive, but hopefully I'll give you a flavour of what's out there and perhaps give you some ideas. And given how creative people that attend EMF are, I'm quite excited about hearing from you in the bar later on any alternative methods you might have come up with, hopefully legal ones. Okay, so I'm going to start with donating your body to medical science, because if ever there was an audience to talk to about it, it's probably this one. This is something that's massively appreciated by the staff and students of the medical schools. And if it's something that you choose to do, your body can be used for three purposes. It can either be used for anatomical examination, where students and healthcare professionals are taught the structure and function of the human body, or it can be used to research the human body and how it works, or you could possibly be used for surgical training. The Human Tissue Authority, who produced this guide, are responsible for licensing and inspecting the institutions involved. And they're regulated by the Anatomy Act of 1984 and the Human Tissue Scotland Act of 2006. I'm not sure what's different about Scottish bodies. I'm quite interested in finding out if anybody knows. And that sets out that those acts set out the legal framework for the removal, the retention and the lawful use of body parts and bodies after death. The key thing with donating your body is you absolutely must give your written consent before you die. I don't know if you'll be relieved to hear or not, but nobody in your family can donate you to medical science after you've gone if they don't have that consent. 
what you do is you get the form from your local medical school, you fill it in, and then you keep it with your will, so it's available when it's needed. But not everybody's body is accepted, so it's really important to have a plan B. So, for example, most medical schools won't donate bodies over Christmas because they have far more interesting things to be doing. Um, you won't get accepted if you've recently had surgery or if you've donated organs. You might not be accepted if you have unusual anatomy or if the donation is more than six days after you've died. If you've had a communicable illness before death or if you've had a variety of neurological disorders, you're also excluded from donating, not just for the brain disorders because it might be something that's infectious if the cause isn't known, but also because rational consent has to be sought, you can't donate, um, they won't accept donations from people who've had those. So most medical schools will come and pick you up unless they're slightly outside, unless you're outside their area, in which case they might ask your estate to pay the removal costs of your body. Nevertheless, donating your body to medical science is probably still the cheapest option. Usually, at the end of the process, they'll meet the costs of cremation, although some of them do offer burials. If you want what's left of you to be buried, and it's not something the medical school offer, they will return what's left of you to your family to be buried. Um, so that might be quite nice if you don't get on with your family. <laughs> There's often a memorial service afterwards that um, is attended by the staff and the students who've learnt from the donor, which is very respectful as it should be, and sometimes the families are able to attend those. So the guidance for each individual, individual medical school varies. So if you have a look at the HTA website, if that's something that you're interested in, they have a finder so you can find your local medical school. Okay, so moving on to burial. If you're not going to donate your body to medical science, nowadays you're almost certainly going to be buried or cremated, although that might change in the future, as we'll hear later on. Usually a funeral director will come and collect the body, will prepare it, and will store it and deliver it to the cemetery or the crematorium where you're being buried or burnt. And they'll also ensure that all the necessary legal forms are completed. It's harder to cremate a body because you can't exhume a cremated body afterwards if there's a problem. Only about a quarter of burials in the U of funerals in the UK at the moment are burials. Traditionally, that's always meant a churchyard or a public ceremony, but there are now lots of these natural woodland burial sites. This one is in Rabness on the North Essex coast, and this is where I'm expecting to end up, hopefully, at some point. Um, typically, in the woodland, in the, the natural burial grounds, you can pick a tree instead of a headstone. And the, the Sun Life Cost of Dying report from 2017 said that a typical burial costs around £4,257 at the moment. There aren't any legal requirements to use a coffin for a funeral, so you can use a shroud or something else if you prefer. Um, there's also no requirement to have somebody lead the funeral, so your family could stand up and speak and you don't have to have a minister or a humanist celebrant or anybody else in charge. And if you would like to prepare the body yourself and transport the body yourself, there are some funeral directors which offer a storage-only service for you. The Natural Death Handbook, the old edition, I don't know about the new edition, actually had plans for how to build your own coffin. Um, and you can use it as a bookcase in the meantime. Now, my ex-husband, when we were married, refused to build me a coffin, but I bet if I asked him now, he'd be absolutely delighted. <laughs> so as well as coffins made out of cardboard and wood and MDF and bamboo and willow, somebody in America is now offering something they call the infinity suit, which is a suit, a shroud suit, and the, the threads of the suit are impregnated with mushroom spores. So after death, the mushrooms will consume your body and its toxins, so it eats you and it leaves behind clean and pollutant-free compost afterwards. Now, I'm not going to talk anymore about traditional burials. There are two types of burial I'd like to focus on. The first one is burial at sea, and then I'll talk about how to bury somebody in your back garden. 
So burial at sea, as you can imagine, there are special requirements for the materials and the designs used in the coffin. So for example, if you want to be buried at sea, the coffin has to have between 40 and 52 inch holes drilled in it and around 200 kilograms of iron or steel or concrete clamped to the base of the coffin. And obviously this is to prevent the body being returned to the shore by tidal currents or inadvertently picked up by fishing nets. You've also got to make sure that the body isn't embalmed, and that's because of pollution. You've got to make sure it's lightly dressed in biodegradable material, and I can only imagine that's if it gets out and somebody... I don't know, I don't know. And finally, there's got, it's, the body has to have a tightly attached, durable identification tag that says not only the name of the deceased, but also who the funeral director was, pre presumably to prosecute them afterwards for not doing it properly. So anybody can be buried at sea, you don't have to have been in the Navy or anything like that, but you do need a licence which you get from the Maritime Management Organisation via the Gov UK website. A licence costs £50 if you'd like to, be a sea, to have a sea burial off of the Needles at the Isle of Wight, between New Haven and Hastings, or at Tynemouth in North Tyneside. Anywhere else in the UK, you can get a license for £175, but you have to provide exact coordinates and demonstrate evidence that the body's not going to get washed up or picked up by shipping boats. Um, it is worth taking into account, however, that it takes about five hours to get the boat out far enough to conduct the ceremony, and the water tends to be quite choppy. So again, if you don't like your family and they're prone to seasickness... I strongly recommend sea burial as an option. Now, you might think it's easier to scatter ashes on the sea instead, but please be aware that if you're doing it off of HMS Belfast on the Thames, which was my father's final commission, and so we went to scatter him from there, you can only do it when the tide is going out, which is quite straightforward. But you have to be careful because you run the risk of at the exact moment your brother is squatting down to scatter your father's ashes into the water, a tourist boat goes past with their noses pressed up against the window. So it might not be quite as dignified as, as you would have perhaps hoped for. Okay, so burying people in your back garden. Um, I know it sounds unlikely, but do you, have you heard of Kirsty Allsop, the woman of, of location, location, location? Yep. Yeah. She honoured her mother's wish to be buried at home in the back garden. So she's probably the most high-profile person who's buried somebody in the back garden. It's legal to bury somebody on private land in the United Kingdom as long as you have permission of the landowner. Now, I don't know how that works with mortgages, so you might need to explore that. Every burial's got to be recorded in a burial register, stating the full name, address, age of the deceased, the date and place of the burial, and the name of the minister or celebrant or the registrar that recorded the death. Now, this register could be as simple as a single sheet of paper, but it's got to be kept in a safe place to ensure that it's not lost and nobody accidentally digs up whoever you've buried in your garden. And equally, there's got to be a plan showing the exact coordinates. And the recommendation is that the plan and the register are stored with the deeds of the house. I can't imagine what the estate agents will do with that at some point in the future. So this is this lovely house, and people are asking why it's so cheap, and it's because she's at the end of the garden. If you like the sound of this, I cannot possibly recommend the Garden Burial website highly enough, because the guidance around this says things like you should consult the local council about not, um, not messing up the local water table, and actually, it recommends that you should consult them. And this, the, that website offers fantastic guidance on just crack on with it, because if the government don't agree, they've got to get a license to exhume the body, and it's very, very unlikely that they'll do it. So I offer you that website as something you may be interested in if you have hopefully a large back garden and you'd like to keep somebody at home after they've died. So moving on to cremation then. Cremation is by far the most popular way of disposing of a body in the United Kingdom. There are about 300 crematoria around the country. Now, crematoria are usually near a main road. They are open Monday to Friday during normal working hours. And most of them have a fantastic combination of free parking, 
a clean toilet, chilled water, and a tea and coffee machine. Now, the tea and coffee might not win any prizes, but if you're traveling with children, it's a brilliant place to stop instead of running the gauntlet at the local service station. So, and my son can testify to this. Anyway, cremation process. Once the ceremony is over at the crematorium or wherever you hold it, usually the curtains close, and once the congregation have left, the coffin passes either... It passes from the catafalque, so that's a catafalque that it rests on. So the body either is hidden behind curtains or sometimes they drop down out of sight. Um, I'm not aware of any crematoria in the United Kingdom where the doors open into the fires of hell. I think that's a film thing, and I'm fairly confident in saying that's just not something that you see. So the coffin's withdrawn into a room behind called the committal room, where they check the name plate on the coffin and they fill out a card and that card then stays with the body and then the remains until they're collected from the crematorium. The coffin's put into the cremator. The cremator is a cubicle which only allows for the insertion of one standard size coffin, although that said there are now more and more cremators being replaced around the country with bigger ovens, basically, because we're getting bigger as a nation. So years ago, it used to be that somebody who was very, very obese could only be buried, but now they can, they can fit them in. Um, so cremation takes around one to three hours between 870 and 980 degrees Celsius, and it's always done on the same day, or almost always done on the same day. The coffin is never opened, nothing is added, nothing is taken away once it's taken out of sight. And that's because the funeral directors have already taken out the breast implants and the pacemakers, and they've checked that you've not hidden a mobile phone in there, because exploding mobile phones in cremators are not a very good thing. Now, once the process is over in the cremator, the technician rakes out the remains, but what comes out of a cremator isn't ash. What comes out is bone fragments and coffin ashes and things like artificial hip joints. So this is all taken to a second room where after the metal's been removed, the, the remains are placed in the cremulator. <laughs> you always have to say it in that voice. The cremulator basically pulverizes the remains into ash. Now, the old ones were pretty much a tumble dryer with a few granite balls inside them. I'm so sorry for those of you who didn't know this already and are now traumatized by this. Basically, tumble dryer, great big balls of granite inside it. You put the remains in, they're smashed up for a while, they fall through a grill at the bottom, and then you have ashes. The more modern ones involve rotating blades or flails chains and the one in my local crematorium has been replaced quite recently with a rotating chain um, my other half found this out when i took him to the annual open day where you can go behind the scenes um, which i thought was a really really good date but <laughs> i'm not convinced that he did but you can ask him in the bar later Right, so back to the ashes. Studies have shown that an average male produces about three and a half kilograms of ashes and an average woman produces about two and a half. The container that you pick them up in is a similar size to and looks a bit like an old sweetie jar. And they will release ashes either to a named individual, so for example a family member, or they'll release them to the funeral director that you used. If you don't go for a traditional scattering, and just be aware, there's quite a lot of ash. So if you don't go for a traditional scattering, there are lots of options to choose from. So quite recently, the news has reported there are at least two occasions I know of where somebody's ashes have been scattered into the mosh pit at a gig of their favourite band. There was a young lad called Nye Newman who died at the age of 17. He was quite a well-known free runner, and his mother had his ashes divided up into 100 bags and sent them off with family and friends to be scattered all around the world so that he could travel after his death at the age of 17. But you can do so much more than just scatter ashes. So this is my friend Helen and Helen's husband, Steve. She's given me permission to share their story, which I think is very generous of her. So in 2009, Steve died, and after, his, after organ donation, where three people benefited, 
I was asked to conduct Steve's funeral and we cremated him. Helen then had some of his ashes put into shotgun cartridges because Steve was actually an instructor at Clacton Shooting Club. And so she proceeded to hold a shooting party with Steve in the ammunition. <laughs> I believe she's watching at the moment, so thank you for that. Um, Helen was also one of the first people in the country to have somebody's ashes turned into diamond. So they extract carbon from about 100 grams of ashes. They add some other stuff, and then they put it into a high-pressure, high-temperature machine under a pressure of around 6,000 atmospheres and a temperature of around 2,000 degrees Celsius, a diamond is created. So a half-carat white diamond is around £4,000, and a similar half-carat diamond, but much more yellow, is around 2300 And it takes between two to four months, depending on the colour that you would like. So diamonds are really expensive, but there are loads and loads of companies now making all sorts of jewellery that you can incorporate your loved one's ashes in, whether that's a human or your pets. So as you can see, there's, there's beads up there for charm bracelets, and there are rings, there are cufflinks, there are pendants, there are all sorts of things. And if you don't want to wear them, you can have glass art made to put on your wall, or on the far right there, you can actually have them made into a paperweight. So if you really want to permanently wear them, you can actually have ashes put into a tattoo. So the earliest tattoos were basically ash from a fire rubbed into a pre-designed wound. Memorial tattoos are just the next step on. What they do is they pick some of the finest ashes from the remains and they mix them with ink and then you're good to go. Alternatively, for music lovers, there's a UK company called And Vinally. <laughs> no, it gets worse. They offer you the chance to live on from beyond the groove <laughs> by having your ashes incorporated into a vinyl disc. The basic package is about £2,000, and that will get you 30 records with custom artwork and any sounds you choose lasting a maximum of 24 minutes. Now, their high-end options also involve global distribution to record stores. So if you're a serious muso, you might want to check that one out. Much more short-lived, but a hell of a lot louder is having yourself put into fireworks. Now, before I start to talk about putting ashes into fireworks, can I please emphasize that you should never, ever attempt to dismantle a firework to put ashes or anything else in it because it's highly dangerous and it's potentially illegal. And obviously, there isn't a single person in this room who would consider trying that. So there, I'm not responsible for whatever happens. So in 2005, the writer Hunter S. Thompson made the news by having his ashes fired out of a 150-foot cannon in a firework display. So if fireworks are doing it for you, there are three main options. The first one is you can have some ashes put into one large rocket, get fired several hundred feet in the sky, and then as it explodes, you have a spectacular scattering of ashes. That's about 70 to 100 pounds. Or you can have them put in a large consumer firework, which I gather is called a cake. I think hopefully that's the only way ashes are going to get into a cake. Um, typical costs for that are between two or three hundred pounds. And that's one of those large ones that you light and then it goes bang, 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 bang. So some ashes are going to be fired with each of those. And then finally, you can also have, um, you can go the whole hog and, and pay upwards of £2,000 to have a professional firework display so you're spread more evenly over your chosen site. And actually, while I've just been reading that, I've remembered an ex-boyfriend of mine at university, a guy called Paul Chambers, who swore he always wanted ashes in an ashtray in the student union bar. Um, but we can't do that anymore. That's a real shame. Sorry, Paul. Okay, so if, if a few hundred feet isn't high enough for you, there's a company called Ascension Flights, that appeared on Dragon's Den to launch their space funeral business in the UK. So you can be scattered from a high altitude balloon for just under 1,500 pounds, or this can happen. Now, hopefully this will work.
it to work. So yeah, drag it to, uh, to the right hand screen. So can you do it? Because it's not going across. Okay, good. So I need to get it back to the beginning as well. Can we not just come out of this and mirror it and do it that way? Take it back to the beginning. Sorry about that. It is worth Sorry. waiting for. Here we go. Not easily from here is the answer to that. No. <laughs> okay, so basically for just over £2,000, they'll launch you from their site in Sheffield and they'll provide a memorial video like that. So they'll, they'll launch you up into space and scatter your ashes from space. And they've got all of this clever tracking equipment so they can get, you back, uh, get the equipment back afterwards. You can also choose your own launch location for more money. Um, but to take things to the next level, there's at least one firm in America going much, much farther and they'll actually either put a portion of your ashes or DNA on the moon, or they'll just send it out into outer space for you. But you're looking at sort of £12,000 worth by that point. So, space doesn't particularly float my boat. On the subject of floating boat, did you see what I did there? Somebody was going to ask me about Viking funerals, so let's just get that one done and dusted. Viking funerals, and by that I mean having your body launched on a burning longboat, to my knowledge isn't legal in the UK at this time. Now I'm talking about a boat that's torched before it leaves, because when I was looking this up, I found an answer on Quora that said, it's been found that it takes a dozen archers about half an hour shooting flaming arrows at a ship to get the desired toasty effect. The audience gets bored and the ship ends up looking like a porcupine. <laughs> so I suggest we set fire to stuff before we send it off. So this is 80 centimeters long. This is actually a floating urn. And it's 80 centimeters long. You can put your ashes, well, you clearly can't if it's your own ashes, but you know what I mean. The ashes of your loved one can be put inside it. You can set light to it and then send it out on a calm sea or a lake. And it takes around half an hour, but obviously duration depends on the conditions. Um, and it says on the website there are pegs to control the speed. Didn't have time to look into how that works. So the last way of scattering ashes I'd like to, well, get disposing of ashes I'd like to talk about is actually the creation of an artificial coral reef. So the one in the UK is um, just off Weymouth and it's called Solace Reef and it's been generated from pyramids of local Portland stone and each stone has a nameplate on it and there you go out to sea and they're pushed off and they sink to the bottom of the sea and they've got a hole in them that you can put in a biodegradable urn containing somebody's ashes. Um, the really interesting thing about Solace Reef that I discovered was the reason that they chose pyramids for this particular site was this was the thing that was most conducive to improving the lobster stocks in the area. The mind boggles. Okay, and just before I move away from, to, to newer, I move on to newer ways of disposing of a body, it's worth just mentioning open funeral pyres. So there was a guy called David Rigglesworth who actually walked free from Leeds Crown Court in 2005 after he burned his mother in the back garden. She died of natural causes in 2002 and he kept her at home for eight weeks before disposing of her body and then proceeded to claim benefits for another two years afterwards and that's why it went to court. But the judge, James Stewart, said the case was extraordinary and I quote, because burning your mother's body, you did not the public may be surprised to hear, commit a criminal offence because you did not burn it or dispose of it 
with the intention of obstructing or preventing a coroner's inquest. Please don't take that as an endorsement or permission or, or just don't. Don't do it. Apparently the neighbours complained about the smell with the bomb. Just, that's as gory as it's going to get, people. It's all fine. Right. So the use of open pyres to satisfy religious um, requirements is still under debate. But in 2010, the Court of Appeal ruled that according to a strict set of criteria, it was legal. There's a council in the north of England who is now um, being challenged to provide a facility where open pyres can actually happen, or at least grant the planning permission for somebody to build such a facility. But there isn't one in the UK yet, to my knowledge. Um, Nevertheless, so there's the, com the campaigner who's been working towards this, a guy called Davinda Guy, actually conducted a, an open-air pyre in 2006, and he wasn't prosecuted as it wasn't in the public interest. Again, please don't be doing these things. <laughs> Just don't. Or if you do, don't blame it on me. So, moving on to then newer ways of disposing of bodies. Um, the most recent development in body disposal is something which has already been adopted in parts of America and Canada and, and recently in Australia. And this is something called alkaline hydrolysis. And it goes by a variety of names, including water cremation or resumation or biocremation. It's very, very similar to the process that was used to get rid of dead cows after the BSE outbreak. Um, but don't let that put you off. I'd just like to apologise here to anybody who's offended by the use of a photograph from the Daily Mail, but it is a really good photograph, so I'm sorry about that. So basically, the body's taken out of the coffin and it's loaded into the chamber. Stage one involves weighing the body in order to calculate how much potassium hydroxide or lye needs to be added. And then in the next stage, the tank is pressurised and filled up with the alkaline solution before being heated up to around 152 degrees Celsius. After three hours, all of the tissue is liquefied and it's drained away to a separate tank where it's cooled before being disposed of. The liquid that comes off looks like tea, um, doesn't contain any human DNA, and it makes a fantastic fertilizer for the garden, although I don't think they've designed the machine with a way of harvesting it off um, however much your loved one enjoyed gardening can you imagine turning up to the cremation with a bowser on the back of the car so you could just know what's left after this process is pure white bones and then of course the medical bits again need to be removed like the hip joints and the fillings and then it's back off to the cremulator to make pure white ashes so the first place to introduce water cremation in the United Kingdom was going to be Rowley Regis Crematorium near Birmingham. But Seven Water has held up the process because it won't grant them a trade effluent license because people are very squeamish about dissolved bodies going into the water system. It's a real pity because this only uses 10% of the energy of a standard cremation and there's no air pollution. So I suspect this is something that's going to be happening in the United Kingdom very, very soon. Finally, and I'm not going to risk the video, it's too hard. I want to talk about something called permission. So permission is basically freeze drying a body. This process was developed in Sweden. And what happens is there are five steps. So you take the body out of the coffin and it gets placed into a chamber, and then it's frozen in liquid nitrogen to crystallize the body. And then the body's put onto a plate where you're vibrated for a minute, and you turn to dust. Then they have to freeze dry it, and then what's left is put into a small biodegradable, they call it coffin, but it's, it's small, it's quite small. And because it's, and it's made out of cornstarch or potato starch, and then that can be buried quite shallowly. And within a year, it's turned into um, soil, basically. And all of their videos have you planting a tree at the end, which is lovely, but I don't think the trees are kind of compulsory and necessary part of the process. And it's really sad, actually, because although the company's been going for 20 years, and there are a couple of other companies trying to push a similar thing, I can't find anywhere where permission or cryomation or whatever you want to call it has actually taken off yet. 
That said, again, if this appeals to you, I suspect by the time it's your time, sorry to flag that up, it might be available much more widely. So, those are the ways in the UK that I am aware of that you can currently legally dispose of a body, but as somebody who's been conducting funerals for 14 years, I'd like to just really gently offer a caveat. When you decide what you'd like done with your body, record it in your will by all means, make it clear what you'd like, but don't make the arrangements too complex or too detailed or unachievable because it, it leads to a huge amount of stress for the family afterwards. Just be clear about what you want and let your family organize the details. So, I'm Sophie Lovejoy, and you've been the largest audience I've ever spoken to, which didn't involve explosives, but... Thank you so much for coming and listening. And I'd actually prefer to take questions in the bar today, if that's okay. It's been a hell of a week. Attending as many funerals as I do has made me realize that life is really short. And I urge you to take every opportunity that you possibly can, which is how I found myself on stage A at EMF camp talking about dead bodies. I'll see you in the bar. Thank you. Thank you.